but it's good to be back, I should say. Our Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this church family. Please, would you speak to us now and to the children in their groups too, and to those following on the live stream to help us to encourage and help each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, whose idea was it to do a talk on Jesus and sex? Uh, Goodies and baddies have been turned upside down in this area. A hundred years ago, biblical sexual ethics were seen as good, even if they were secretly broken. Uh, These days, those of us who hold to traditional biblical sexual ethics are the baddies, uh, cancelled, deplatformed, sometimes vilified. Many Christians respond by changing their beliefs. They follow culture rather than scripture. As the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, they do this to suit their own desires, gathering teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. My temptation, maybe yours, is not to change what I believe, but to hide it. Um, I feel like it's bad news, and so maybe at at work or at school or with wider family, we, we hope nobody asks us those difficult questions. But what do we call the Bible's message? We call it good news, right? And so this is a better story than the stories in wider culture. When I say story, I I don't mean it's fiction. Um, It's true, absolutely. Um, But it's also beautiful as well as true. One sermon is not enough to do real justice to this subject. And I realize this subject, is, this subject is very personal as well. So please forgive me in advance for treading on many raw nerves. I pray that we will find today on the lips of Jesus a better story of grace and truth. Um, but first, before we really get into the Bible, Bible by way of introduction... Our first point is this. The world's approach to sex was monstrous. The world's approach to sex was monstrous. Well done. In his wonderful book, The Air We Breathe, Glenn Scrivener describes um, the approach to sex among Roman culture at the time of Jesus. He imagines asking a Roman back then, how much is a little girl worth? The answer would vary. If you could salvage her from the rubbish heap where she'd been thrown, she was yours for free, uh, and all yours. If a slave trader got to her first, you'd have to pay eight months' wages for her. Um, Or you could have her for a night for a loaf of bread. Either way, there was in that culture zero moral problem with a man using a child for his own, end, his own ends. What we call abuse, they thought was the proper use of sex as normal as brushing your teeth. Oh, they had sexual ethics. Their ethics were you, you couldn't sleep with a married woman or a high-born woman. Uh, the best alternative, uh, they felt, was to sleep with slaves or prostitutes. Uh, And all that was right for men to do, but in that culture that was all wrong for women. And paedophilia was fine. As author Tom Holland writes, sex was an exercise of power. As captured cities were to the sword of the army, so the bodies of those used sexually were to the Roman man. The world's approach to sex was monstrous. Now, maybe you're thinking, hang on, Reuben, that was 2,000 years ago. We don't have Roman sexual ethics today. Uh, Come on, Reuben, you don't have to be a Christian to reject Roman sexual ethics. Uh, We all know that's wrong. Yes, we do. Isn't that great? But why do we? What makes us so sure that Roman ethics were wrong? And what made society change? How did we come to value things like consent, equality, and the rights of children? 
You may remember that Larry Nassar um, was convicted of sexually assaulting hundreds of women and children while he was the team doctor of USA Gymnastics. When one of his victims, Rachel Den Hollander, concluded the evidence against Larry Nassar, she said this. She said, I have clung to a quote by C.S. Lewis, where he says, My argument against God was that the universe was cruel and unjust. But how did I get this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he first has some idea of straight. What was I comparing the universe to when I called it unjust? Larry, she said, I can call what you did wicked and evil because the straight line exists. How much is a little girl worth? Glenn Scrivener argues the reason why we know instinctively that a little girl like Rachel Den Hollander is worth everything. The reason why Western culture eventually changed from those monstrous Roman values is because Jesus drew the straight line. And he brought a different kind of sexual revolution centuries before the 1960s. So friends, let us listen to Jesus telling us a better story. So with the next slide, please, and the second point. We've seen first, the world's approach to sex was monstrous. Secondly, Jesus taught that sex is for marriage. Jesus taught that sex is for marriage. So turn, please, if you haven't already, to Matthew chapter 19 and page 986 in the Church Bibles. Here we are with Jesus under blue skies and wading across the Jordan River to the dusty land beyond. And here at her elbow is Jesus', Jesus disciple, Matthew. And he seems to be concentrating rather hard because many years later he's going to write it down. Well, not so many years. He's going to write it down anyway in Matthew's gospel. Well, Matthew's happy storyline is this, that Jesus is the king who was promised in the Old Testament. But Matthew has a sad storyline as well, which is this, that people reject King Jesus. People reject King Jesus. And so as the crowds heave and jostle, watch a jealous huddle of religious leaders weaving their way through the crowd, and they've come to test Jesus. They want to catch Jesus out. So Matthew 19 and verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and healed, he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to, t- to him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. Is it okay to divorce our wives for any and every reason, the leaders ask? Jesus says, no. But let me explain why. Because sex is for marriage. Some people reject biblical sexual ethics because they say that's just the Apostle Paul being mean. But here is Jesus teaching the exact same truth that Paul teaches elsewhere. Look at the order of the steps in verse 5. Step A is marriage. Verse 5, for for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. That's marriage. Then step B is sex. End of verse 5 and the two will become one flesh. Step C, there is no step C. So Jesus teaches that sex is for marriage. And he teaches it's been like that from creation. Again, when people want to ignore the Bible's demands, they say that the Bible's teaching was not for all time, but it was for that culture then. And they say we we should draw a trajectory out of the Bible into our culture today. 
But can you see, even Jesus didn't make up some new teaching for his culture. Uh, He simply quotes from the very beginning of the Bible, from Genesis uh, chapter uh, 1 and 2. So verse 4, Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Jesus' teaching that sex is for marriage is not meant to change with culture. It's from creation. It's from before the fall. It's how the world was designed to be. God has always said that sex is for marriage. It's from creation and is for a man and a woman. I realize that's very countercultural, but my job is not to teach what the culture says, it is to teach what the Bible says. Can you see, Jesus says here very clearly, not once but twice, that marriage is for a man and a woman. So, verse 4 again. At the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Not for the first time. In Leviticus chapter 18 and 20, the Bible says, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable, the Bible says. And not for the last time. In Romans Chapter 1, in a list of sinful behavior, God says, even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. And we could look at similar Bible verses in 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. Now, I realize this could be very painful for some and very hard to hear. And I'm really not here to point a finger or to condemn. God's point in that Romans passage is that actually none of us can look down on anyone else because we're all sinners. Personally, I feel like I'm a bigger sinner than anyone. And we'll find in a, find in a minute some very, very good news for us all. And yet, Jesus teaches here very clearly that sex is for marriage, and marriage is for a man and a woman. For a man and a woman, and it's for life. For life. Verse 6. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. God uses sex within marriage like like a superglue. Uh, emotionally, mentally, in every way to stick two people together. Uh, but it's not, well, it's not meant to be like, like a sticky note, that you know, we stick to this, and then we stick to that, then we stick to that. It loses its stick otherwise. Now, the religious leaders rub their chins here, and they think, mm, aha, we think we've caught you out. Jesus, didn't Moses say in the Bible that you could have a certificate, uh, that that you could divorce your wife so long as you gave her a certificate. Verse 7, Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wife because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Uh, Jesus says, yes, Moses allowed divorce for, uh, for, uh, at that time as a concession because your hearts are so hard. Moses knew that uh, you were going to leave your wives anyway. So he said, at least give them some dignity and some protection. Give them a certificate. But that's not God's way. God's way is for marriage to be for life. Now, many of us I realize they're deeply affected by divorce in various ways. And I'm probably stepping on some very raw nerves. Some of us may be the victims of another, another person's sin in this area. Others of us may have had very, very hard decisions to make. Although marriage is for life, Jesus does give an exception in verse 9 for sexual immorality. Anyone who divorces his wife except 
for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. If someone commits adultery, then their innocent husband or wife is free. But Jesus' headline is marriage is for life. Marriage is for life. But marriage is not for everyone. Sex is for marriage. Marriage is not for everyone. Look at verse 10, would you? Verse 10. The disciple said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. You have to wonder what their wives were thinking. Verse 11, Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it's been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. You'll know that a eunuch was a man who, for some reason, had been castrated. And Jesus says, I get it. I get that not everyone can accept this teaching and God's design for marriage. Jesus is not saying that men should go and castrate themselves. But he is saying, if you can't accept marriage God's way, there is an alternative, and that is to stay celibate. Marriage is not for everyone. Now, don't take my word for that. Listen to the thousands of people who are same-sex attracted, but love Jesus and have stayed single and celibate. Listen to my old friend, Sam Albury, for example, who married Hannah and me. Sam is single and celibate. Sam says, and I quote, there is no gospel without repentance. He said, if you don't include someone in the call to repentance, you exclude them from the gospel. Ironically, he said, calls for greater inclusivism in the church are not inclusive enough. Six years ago, uh, Sam stood up in the House of Bishops, this was six years ago, and he said, do you really believe in the doctrine of marriage? He said, is it good news for the world? He said, I and many others have found that it is life-giving, as Jesus' message always is. Sam would be the first to agree that sex is for marriage. And maybe you say, hang on, Reuben, how is this good news? How is this a better story? I mean, maybe Jesus' teaching was better than the abusive sexual ethics of Roman culture, but haven't we moved on? Isn't today's liberal progressive attitudes better still? Why shouldn't we have gay marriage and easy divorce and casual sex? How is Jesus' teaching emotionally plausible? when for so many people it's so hard? Those are great questions with a beautiful answer. So with our last slide, please. Let's see, finally and thirdly, in this better story, marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. I'm going to read from a bit of Ephesians, chapter 5. I think maybe on the screen. And it says this, Ephesians 5, verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. In this better story, marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. The church is the bride, and Jesus actually called himself the groom. When we say the church here, we don't mean obviously a building or an institution. We mean the worldwide church, all those who trust in the Lord Jesus. Imagine um, a child who plays husbands and wives with their teddies. Uh, Darth Vader marries a Barbie girl, and they have a lovely family of baby Sylvanian families. Beautiful. But imagine this child, they have played this game every day, uh, husbands and wives with their teddies, but imagine they don't realize that there is such a thing as real marriage. They think that the teddy marriage is, is all there is, and there's no such thing as the reality. 
Well, that is, that is the mistake that most people make. They live for and they die for our fleeting and flawed human relationships, thinking that's all there is to love, when marriage is just a pale, temporary, and often cracked reflection of the beautiful marriage, the perfect and ultimate marriage between Christ and the church. Just before our verse, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. It's a beautiful love story. Amazingly, Jesus loved us when we were filthy. Maybe we know that we've sinned sexually and we feel so guilty. Maybe we've talked or joked in crude or bigoted ways. Maybe we've entertained fantasies that we know are wrong. Maybe we've pointed the fingers at others in this area and found four fingers pointing back at us. What love? That Christ should love the church, should love us when we were like that. How did he love us? How did he wash us clean? Ephesians 5 verse 25 says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. At the ladies' Bible study, you've been exploring the beautiful uh, story in the Bible of Hosea and how uh, God sent Hosea to buy his wife back uh, from the prostitute house. God in Christ came to earth like Hosea. Jesus never married. If you're single, he knows what that's like. But he died to buy us out of our spiritual adultery, even though that adultery was against him. He died to wash us, so that now, however dirty we've been, by faith we are now spiritually lovely, and one day by sight we will be too. Jesus said that in heaven we won't need human marriage, because the temporary artist sketch of marriage uh, will be overtaken by the real thing. Christ and the church. What joy. Now, before we close, briefly, what does this all mean for sex and marriage today? On the one hand, it means marriage is more important than you think. It's more important that sex is for marriage, not because we're spoiled sports, but because it's a visual aid for Christ's faithfulness to the church. It's more important that marriage is for a man and a woman, not because we're bigoted, but because it's a visual aid that Christ isn't married to Christ. He's married to the church. It's more important that marriage is for life, not because we're super strict, but as a visual aid that Christ will never let us go, whatever happens. And that is why we must not give in to culture in these areas, even if everyone else does. It's so important. Marriage is more important than you think. And finally, marriage is less important than you think. It's less important than you think. See, how did Jesus finish that section in Matthew 19? Remember what he said. Jesus said, some choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Some choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, if someone for whatever reason has to choose between sex within marriage and the kingdom of heaven, Christians love King Jesus so much that they gladly choose him because marriage is just a visual aid. I wonder if we Christians are sometimes guilty uh, of making marriage more important than it is when we go on and on and on about how wonderful marriage is. Uh, when, uh, maybe when we at church always sit in couples and never with friends. When all my sermon illustrations are about family. When we make home a castle, visitable only by appointment. When we invite only couples or families for meal, and not the single or widowed or divorced. And when our greatest fear 
is that our children might grow up single. I quoted my friend Sam Aubrey. He's one of the kindest, nicest men you'll ever meet. But after Sam gave a talk on this subject at church, there was a question time afterwards. And one parent put up a hand and they said, how can we make sure our children don't end up like you? Friends, I thank the Lord for marriage. But it is less important than you think. It's a visual aid for the the infinitely important marriage between Christ and the church. Sam's non-Christian family and friends think he's mad. Why not find a nice man, settle down, have children? They say to him, you're throwing away your life. The philosopher Nietzsche said, those who hear not the music think the dancers mad. You see someone dancing, but you can't hear the music. It just looks crazy. Those who hear not the music think the dancers mad. Sam says, Jesus is the music. Jesus is the music. Friends, we're going to sing in a moment. And do please join us for cake and refreshments upstairs. Uh, do remember to collect your children and your belongings. Um, I should say, if this has touched any raw nerves, uh, please don't throw too many eggs or tomatoes at me afterwards. But um, feel, please feel, feel free to ask, to talk. Be happy to talk if that would help. Uh, or you may well find a friend uh, sitting next to you who would happily talk with you too. Um, I'm delighted that we're going to sing as the musicians kindly step up. We're going to sing in Christ alone um, because whatever is going through our heads or or our hearts right now, Christ alone is where our hope is found. Let's stand and sing together. Guilt in life, no fear in death. This is 
Father, may it be right that no power of hell, no scheme of man will ever pluck us from his hands till he returns or calls us home because here in the power of Christ we stand. Amen.